A very good evening and welcome to the news tonight where we get you the day's top stories from India and across the world. I'm Tracy Shilshi and let's start with the headlines. The Patel community agitation for OBC status turns violent in Gujarat. Five people are killed so far as Prime Minister Modi appeals for peace. Curfew remains imposed in many districts. Sell-off pressure from foreign investors and the China crisis affects Indian markets again. Sensex falls over 300 points. Nifty loses close to 90 points. Negotiations break down over the implementation of the One Rank One Pension proposal for Army veterans. Protesters demand meeting with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Union Cabinet extends the term of the 7th Pay Commission by four months. The panel is given time till the 31st of December to submit its report. And amid a fresh push to resolve the Syrian crisis, President Assad counter speculation that he could be eased out, rules out alliance against the Islamic State. Our top story this evening, Asian stock markets continue to be volatile for the third day of the week. This was in continuation with China's stock market crash that remained unchecked. However, the crisis is expected to benefit emerging economies like India as some investors leaving China could turn their attention to safer investment destinations. Here's a report. Despite an interest rate cut and efforts to infuse liquidity, the free fall of Chinese stocks continued unchecked for the third day in a row. The Shanghai Composite Index closed down by 1.3%, its fifth straight day of loss. Major European markets opened 2% down. The Asian stock market stayed volatile. Japanese and Indonesian stocks stabilized and closed in positive. But Indian stocks were trading in the red after recovering a day earlier. The money which is there in the Chinese stock market is for returns. And if their expected returns are likely to be lower than what they had expected, uh, then obviously they will uh, look for, uh, uh, you know, other uh, places or elsewhere. On Wednesday, the key Indian indices, BSC and NSC, slumped again. Both closed down by more than 1% on Wednesday. But the industry is optimistic that the wary global investors will turn to India due to strong fundamentals. India is a stable, democratic country governed by rule of law, which has a majority government today and is assured of reforms, will seem very attractive. Apart from any other emerging market, it should be the best destination for money. Concerns about Chinese economy intensified after its factory output index touched a 77-month low last week. Devaluation of yuan that followed triggered fears of a currency war, as many exporting nations also devalued their currencies in response. However, the sustained crash in Chinese stock market indicates the situation is getting out of hand with unexpected results for other economies. Krishna Antripathi's report for Rajya Sabha TV. Well, for more on the bigger picture, we're joined by P. Vedanathan Ayer, who's the National Affairs Editor at the Indian Express. Mr. Ayer, thanks so much for joining us. Is this a temporary blip that we are seeing, not just in India, but across the world as well, as to, you know, responding to the China market, uh, or is the worst yet to come? See, I think to, to find the bottom of what the stock markets will actually find themselves in over a period of time, that's a very difficult call. But, you know, I must say that, you know, compared to the rest of the world, uh, I think Indian markets, for them, it would be just, you know, very marginal uh, volatility going for going forward. So I don't really see a big impact on India because of various positives that India throws up in the global picture now. And talking about the global picture, uh, there is also now a view that's emerging that after the tanking that we're seeing of China markets are all across the board, uh, you know, the next best investment, at least for the global community, yeah. would be India. And India is actually uh, going to stand to gain in what is now being seen as a major, uh, you, you know, downfall across other economies. Right. You know, there's no doubt on, about that. You know, look at the positives that India sh uh, shows today. You know, we have globally commodity uh, prices are, you know, at, you know, 2008 levels or, you know, seven-year lows. Uh, we have the Brent at, you know, uh, about $40 a barrel uh, compared to what we had initially assumed for the full year to be at about $60, $65 uh, a barrel. 
uh, nickel, cobalt, you know, several commodities are uh, at, you know, seven year, six year or, you know, 10 year lows. Uh, India being, you know, a big importer of, uh, say, uh, crude being, you know, almost 60, uh, 70 percent of our oil needs are met uh, from imports. I think that benefits India a lot. And we make huge savings on uh, which can be uh, which can be actually pushed towards the infrastructure sector. So by and large, you know, given the foreign exchange reserves that we have, a comfortable current account deficit situation that we have today and a strong or go, getting gaining momentum kind of domestic mm. economy that we mm. have mm. i think we are best placed to attract all of uh, a lot of foreign capital in the coming uh, months and years all right so what uh uh, are you saying that, uh, you know, what we're seeing in the stock market is definitely not a reflection of the Indian economy is per se, but uh, the volatility, of course, going to continue looking at all the trends that we're seeing, not just in China, but Asia and the uh, international markets as well? So I was just looking at the Wall Street, uh, which opened, you know, uh, you know, 20, 25 minutes back. And, mm. you know, Wall Street has actually bounced back today by about 300 out points in early trade. Mm. But having said that, I think, you know, China is is a is a very, very big global factor. It's it's a white elephant. We don't really know mm. uh, a lot of things about China in mm. in in just five days, the Chinese stock markets have lost 22%. In last one year, Chinese stock markets have lost almost 43%. And the kind of measures that China has taken are quite unimaginable in an in, in an Indian environment. Mm. You know, uh, the market regulator that we have in SEBI and and uh, and our central bank, they are they are keeping a very close watch, but they are not really uh, they are not really perturbed about uh, you know the if. They're not worried that, you know, it would impact India in a big way because yes. India has got a lot of inherent strength. So mm. I think this market volatility globally would affect a lot of countries, uh, say, a Brazil a, an Argentina, because, you know, a, a lot of countries which are, say, exporting minerals or, you know, uh, commodities. But for India, which is an importer, I think it, it is the best of times. Uh, we we have a we don't really have a bad monsoon this year. Mm. Monsoon has been more or less normal, mm. and you know domestic markets uh, are uh, kind of have not really fallen. They have fallen eight percent compared to say what has happened in the rest of the world. I think India is We're one of the best comparatively better uh, yes. performing markets so far, even in this uh, in in this downfall. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll leave it there for now, Mr. Ayer. Thanks so much for joining us, uh, you know, taking that positivity, of course, from you. And hopefully we will see this positive trend being reflected on the markets as well. Uh, but very quickly, uh, just before we go, Mr. Ayer, if you could just give us an indication. Uh, yes, India, of course, looking stable. But just talking about the Chinese economy, uh, you know, uh, the way, like you've been pointing out, in just five yep. days, we're seeing such a big shift in the way the economy has moved there. Uh, the amount of losses, uh, you know, the... The That's China right. story, is there any yep. way that it can be revived again or is it really seeing a downfall that's going to be really tough to pick up? I think there are very, very fundamental measures which the Chinese government has to take. You know, uh, despite you know pumping in almost $200 billion over the last two months, uh, it hasn't really helped the Chinese uh, stock markets. Uh, I think fundamental reform in terms of, you know, uh, you know, letting letting its currency find its own value mm. uh, on the monetary side to you know making being more transparent, accountable about transparency in its banking sector. I think there are very big reforms which the Chinese uh, uh, government has to look at because you know all along they have been an export driven economy. Now they have to look within. They have to tap their own domestic market, which is a huge market. I think the fundamental or tectonic shifts is what I would say that, you know, China has to look at in the coming months and, you know, couple of years. Mm. Because the Chinese growth cannot really be a 10% or 9.5-10% growth that they have seen, yes. which has been largely export-led for the last, you know, a decade or so. Mm -hmm. Now it is time for them to focus back on the dom on their own domestic economy and uh, bringing about reforms in the domestic market. So I All think, right. uh, but that you know, having said that, uh, in, in India definitely looks much more rosier today. All right, we leave it there for now. Thanks so much, Mr. Ayer, for joining us with that. On to another one of our big stories, and the army has been called in to control the widespread violence in Gujarat. The agitation to the to demanding OBC quota has claimed at least five lives. 
This despite curfew imposed in several cities across the state, including Ahmedabad. Internet services on mobile phones too have been suspended in most sensitive parts of the state to check the spread of rumours through WhatsApp and SMSs. Wireless clashes have claimed at least five lives across Gujarat as members of the Patel community continue their agitation for reservation under the OBC quota. The situation has deteriorated to such an extent that the army has been called in. They have joined a 5,000 strong force of paramilitary personnel already stationed in the state. Amid appeals of maintaining peace and calm from the Prime Minister and the Chief Minister, the army will also conduct flag march on five routes in Ahmedabad, which is the epicenter of the agitation. Mahatma Gandhi and Sardar Patel ni bhoomi ma gai kaal saans thi je prakar nu vatamaan banyu chhe je rite hinsa no asro lewa maa vira ho chhe aapade bada jaaniye chhe hinsa thi kya rehe koi nu bhalu na thawa nu maari sao nagrik bhaiyo bheno ne bhananti chhe kya tiyare ekaj मंत्र हो आप शांति गुजरात के सभी प्रजाजनों को मैं निवेदन करती हूँ अपील करती हूँ कि आप शांति रखिए सलामती का माहौल बनाइए सरकारी संपत्ति वो ही हमारी संपत्ति है और सब लोगों के बीच शांति बनी रहे सब एक दूसरों को सहयोग करें the tension is the result of a mega rally on Tuesday called for and led by 21-year-old Hardik Patel. He's at the forefront of the agitation to demand reservation for Patels. He puts the blame for all the violence on the police. ये विस्तार में जेते पुलिस अधिकारी हुए के निचामा निचो अधिकारी चाहे कांस्टेबल हुए के एएसआई हुए पीएसआई हुए पीआई हुए ये लोगों ने 48 कलाक नहीं दे सस्पेंड करवा मावे कोई पन भोगे जे जे विस्तारों में तेरा आंदोलन चाली रहा चे मेहरबानी करें गवर्नमेंट ने चेतावनी आप ये चीज़ विनती पन करी है चीज़ कि पुलिस तंत्र ने पाचू ले लो। The centre is keeping a close watch on the situation and has assured the state government of full backing in tackling the situation. Curfew is in place in all major cities across the state. शांति बनाए रखने से देश की भला है और सबकी भला है। इसलिए इस तरह से हिंसा होना नहीं चाहिए और जो भी है वो तो राज्य सरकार देखेंगे। एतिहात के तौर पे कर्फ्यू लगाया गया है। देर रात तक स्थिति सुधरी है और आज सुबह से हम स्थिति के ऊपर नजर रख रहे हैं एक बंद का कॉल है। जो पैरामिलिट्री फोर्सेस हमारे पास हैं वो भी एरिया के अंदर पेट्रोलिंग कर रहे हैं। मिलजुल के स्थिति अभी जो है सामान्य की तरह जा रही है। Normal life is paralyzed across Gujarat as schools, colleges and business establishments remained closed in most places. Incidents of arson and stone pelting were also reported from some places. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. In fact, we're keeping a close watch on all developments and in fact, uh, correspondent Vishal Daya is joining us now on the phone line from Ahmedabad. Vishal, first of all, just give us an idea of what you can see around you. Uh, I believe curfew, of course, still on in Ahmedabad and other parts of the state as well. Can you give us an update? Well, as you're right, uh, there are uh, at least a half a dozen uh, police station areas uh, in Ahmedabad uh, where the curfew is, is still in place. Uh, but we have uh, travelled uh, through the city from airport uh, towards the uh, Sarkesh Gandhinagar Highway, that's the SG Highway. And uh, what we witnessed, uh, Tracy, in the last half an hour, 45 minutes, is that uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, a, 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 a very uh, less movement of uh, vehicles on the road. Uh, there are very less people seen around in the areas in the city, which uh, usually at this point in time in the evening, that's somewhere around uh, uh, 8.30, 9 p.m., uh, are filled with, uh, you know, uh, people who come to the restaurants, people who go to the markets, because uh, everything is shut down, the markets are closed, uh, uh, there are only one or few, uh, you know, uh, just just few uh, shops uh, which are open. Uh, there is a heavy police presence, a heavy presence of uh, security.
security personnel almost on every circle in the city out here. And uh, the army uh, did a flag march in the city earlier in the day. Uh, also, there are, there is an additional force which has been rushed uh, to Gujarat uh, by the center. 5,000 paramilitary personnel are already here. Uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, being told that at least uh, one more uh, uh, Indian Air Force flight uh, landed around 7 p.m. in Ahmedabad with more uh, uh, forces to uh, augment uh, uh, the uh, the existing uh, you know security personnel strength uh, in the city out here. Uh, the situation is uh, a bit under control uh, of the administration right now, but mm -hmm. tense as well. Uh, there is uh, an airy calm on the streets out here, on uh, uh, the uh, roads which connect several parts of the city, on the intersections as well. And uh, as we heard, uh, Hardik Patel, uh, the leader of uh, this this entire agitation, uh, giving an ult ultimatum to the state government. Uh, the ultimatum stands for 48 hours to take action against uh, uh, those police officers whom uh, uh, the Patel community alleges that... Uh, uh, they were, uh, you know, high-handed in their approach uh, towards dealing with uh, yesterday's uh, protests. Mm. Uh, the government, on its part, uh, have has once again urged uh, uh, the general public uh, in the state uh, to uh, to try and uh, remain calm. We yes. heard the yeah. statement which came in from the chief minister, even the prime minister himself, uh, speaking in Gujarati. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to reach out to the people of the state. Uh, but as far as uh, you know, the core issue is concerned. That's the demand of uh, the Patel community for. Uh, Reservation. Mm. Uh, that issue stands uh, unresolved as of now. Uh, right. What our sources say that uh, there is no uh, indication as of now of back channel talks between the government and uh, the Patel community. Mm. Both sides are still, uh, uh, you know, adamant on their respective stance. Uh, but right now, for the administration, for the state government, it the is definitely a headache, and they are trying to control it as much as possible. Uh, of course, that 48-hour deadline that you're talking about is, uh, of course, till tomorrow. We'll have to see what eventually happens. But thanks so much, Vishal. We'll keep coming to you for more updates. And talking about a set of demands, a series of meetings have failed to end the deadlock over the implementation of the one-rank-one pension scheme for Army veterans. It's been 11 days since at least six of the protesters have been on a hunger strike, with two of them admitted to hospitals. They have now demanded a meeting with the Prime Minister. A day after the hectic negotiations with the government failed, army veterans have vowed to carry on the hunger strike at Jantar Mantar over their demands for one rank, one pension. They now want a meeting with the Prime Minister to seek an end to the deadlock for the past 74 days. We have defense minister that we will have a meeting. We have told him that we will have a meeting with the Prime Minister. One of the major sticking points remains the date of implementation of the scheme. The ex-servicemen want the scheme to be implemented from 1st of April 2014, while the government insists on the present year. There are speculations that an announcement on OROP may come on 28th of August, the anniversary of the 1965 war. Why we should not forget that Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of this country, before the elections, promised the veterans of this country to implement the one rank, one pension scheme. And now it's been nearly one and a half years that the government is in power. And the government is uh, postponing it, making lame excuses. This is really unfortunate. The veterans held another meeting with Army Chief General Dalbir Singh yesterday, but there was no breakthrough. As the number of protesters grow at the Jantar Mantar, health of those on hunger strike is deteriorating. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, the cabinet has extended the term of the 7th Pay Commission by four months. The commission will now have time until the 31st of December to submit its report. The decision was taken during a cabinet meeting today. The actual term of the commission ends this month. However, the commission had a one-month extension till September. The Commission's report is keenly awaited by nearly 5 million central government employees and over 5 million pensioners. The Cabinet also cleared amendments to arbitration law for faster disposal of commercial disputes. And still ahead, we're getting you more national news. Suspected Maoist ambush a BSF team in Odessa, killing three Jawans. Details of that in a bit.
religion-wise census data finally made public. What do the demographic trends indicate? What are the implications of the findings? Watch the big picture at 9.30 p.m. on Rajya Sabha Television. Welcome back. You're watching the news tonight. Now, ISRO has begun countdown for the launch of the GSAT-6 communication satellite on Thursday. GSLV D6 satellite launcher will take off from Sri Harikota in Andhra Pradesh. The launch vehicle is powered by the indigenously developed upper cyrogenic stage. This will be the ninth flight of the GSLV and the third development flight using a cyrogenic engine. It will put the satellite weighing over 2,000 kilos into space. With that, let's take you through other national news updates in Nationwide. Three BSF personnel were killed and six Jawans were injured today after suspected Maoists ambushed the paramilitary team in Malkangiri district of Orissa. The BSF was on its patrol when the landmine exploded, followed by firing from rebels. Fresh reinforcement of the BSF has been rushed in from nearby areas. An encounter broke out between militants and security forces near the line of control in Uri sector today. The exchange of fire started this morning after security forces launched a search operation to find militants hiding in the area. One militant was killed during the encounter. Congress Vice President Rahul Gandhi visited areas hit by Pakistan shelling in Balakot district of Jammu. He, uh, in fact, met the families of six civilians who were killed in ceasefire violations. Rahul Gandhi is on a three-day tour of the state and he'll be also visiting Kashmir and the Ladakh region. The Supreme Court stayed the Guwahati High Court order directing a CBI probe against Arunachal Pradesh Chief Minister Nabam Tuki. He is accused of corruption in awarding state contracts to his family members. It has been alleged that Nabam awarded contracts without inviting tenders when he was the PWD Minister. India today signed an information exchange agreement with Seychelles on tax matters, a step to strengthen its fight against black money. Several other pacts were also signed uh, to strengthen cooperation in security and defence. Seychelles President James Alex Michel, who is on a three-day visit to India, held talks with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. India has pledged to provide a second Dornier maritime patrol plane to Seychelles to strengthen cooperation in maritime security in the Indian Ocean region. Both countries also pledged their support to the Paris Climate Change Summit, which is scheduled to be held later this year. The Prime Minister also thanked Michel for endorsing India's candidature for permanent membership in the UN Security Council. Both India and Seychelles have agreed to cooperate in areas of space, managing land and marine resources, fisheries advisory, weather forecasting and disaster management. President Michel's visit has imparted additional momentum to our relations. Our bilateral agreement for cooperation and blue economy step forward in our relationship and in promoting sustainable ocean economy in the region. Seychelles and India have strong convergent views on climate change and have called for an ambitious agreement at the Paris conference. This visit has reinforced our relationship and strategic partnership to a new level. Meanwhile, External Affairs Minister Sushma Swaraj today held talks with her German counterpart Frank Walter Steinmeier on the German language issue. The government caused some unpleasantness last November when it discontinued the teaching of German language as an alternative to Sanskrit. However, both sides are close to resolving the problem and an announcement is likely during Chancellor Angela Merkel's visit to India in October. Swaraj arrived in Germany yesterday on a two-day visit, which is aimed at strengthening economic engagement. Now, at a time when Western nations like France are insisting on the removal of President Bashar al-Assad to solve the Syrian crisis, Assad said that he is confident of continuing support from continued support, in fact, from its allies, Iran and Russia. Assad also ruled out hope for an alliance against Islamic State, which he claimed is a coalition with his enemies. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad countering speculation that he could be forced out to reach a settlement in his country's ongoing crisis. In a rare television interview with Hezbollah's official channel, Assad swore by the friendship of Iran and Russia, calling them loyal. Earlier, Russian President Vladimir Putin discussed the Syrian crisis with Jordan's King Abdullah as they met in Moscow. 
The only way we can find a solution for Syria is the vital role that you and your country uh, play to find a political solution uh, for all parties to bring uh, stability uh, to that uh, country that has endured so much. While Iran and Russia want Assad as part of political solution in Syria, France claims Assad and terrorists are bound up together. Assad also said that there is little hope for an alliance against the Islamic State as it will mean joining hands with backers of Syrian rebels to indicate Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has ruled out any coalition with Assad. Like the United States, it blames Assad for the rise of Islamic State and says he cannot partner the fight against the group. However, Russia says the United States should cooperate with Assad, especially in Iraq and Syria. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, now let's take you through all other international stories as well in Global Buzz. The Haqqani network leader Abdul Aziz Haqqani was today named specially designated global terrorist by the US. This brings him under the ambit of the US sanctions, prohibiting US nationals from maintaining any relationship with him as well as resulting in seizure of his assets in the US. The Italian Coast Guard rescued 120 migrants 40 nautical miles off the Libyan coast. The migrants were spotted at sea, packed into a rubber dinghy. The migrants were taken to the southern island, uh, Italian island of Lamedusa, where they will be placed in a temporary centre. Two men wearing Afghan security force uniforms opened fire on Wednesday inside a military base in South Afghanistan. Two NATO service members were killed. NATO offered few details, though, about the shooting in Afghanistan's southern Helmand province. Two television journalists were shot during a live interview in the US. They were doing a show at a plaza when shots rang out. Both the reporter and the camera person died in the incident. And now let's change tracks and get you all the latest from the world of sports in Sportsbeat. Indian athlete Larita Babar gave an impressive performance to finish eighth in the women's 3,000 meter steeplechase at the World Athletics Championships in Beijing today. Lalita clocked 9 minutes and 29.64 seconds despite leading majority of the race. The race was eventually won by a Kenyan runner in 9 minutes and 19.11 seconds. Former world champion Vishnathan Anand drew with Vasilin Topolov of Bulgaria in the Sinkafield Cup. After two defeats in the first two rounds, this was Anand's first point in the tournament. He is at the bottom of the table with half a point, while Topolov remains on top of the table with two and a half points. 13-year-old Indian-American Natasha Subhash has got a wildcard entry into the US Open Juniors. She became the youngest ever Indian origin player to play for the Junior Girls title in a Grand Slam event. Subhash may also be given a wildcard to play in the Junior Girls Doubles Championship. Talking of the US Open, Novak Djokovic and Serena Williams have been named as the top seeds for the tournament, which starts next Monday in New York. Williams is followed on the, seeding, on the seeding list by Simona Halep and Maria Sharapova. In the men's singles category, Roger Federer is the second seed. And that's all we have for you on the news tonight from the entire team here. Good night and see you again tomorrow.